Welcome to the Front Frontiers of Brain Health uh, talk series. Good afternoon. At the Center for Brain Health, we strive to be leaders in exploring brain research, and we're also very interested in and committed to translational aspects that translate into innovations that make things possible for improving life. Our goal is to understand, protect, and heal the brain. Today's topic is um, could not be more timely. Uh, it's about dogs being in the home office. Dogs are the unsung heroes of the pandemic, lifting our moods, forcing us to exercise sometimes against our will, and increasing our dopamine and oxytocin levels as they do so. Uh, we know that canine human relationships go back millennia, but what does the science tell us? Today, we're going to focus on this with Dr. Nancy G. She is the director of the Center for Human Animal Interaction at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, a visionary center focused on the, on the effects of animal interactions on human well being. Dr. G is a professor of psychiatry and holds the Bill Balaban Chair in Human-Animal Interactions. She was hand-selected for this position due to her uniqueness across the field. She was initially a basic human memory researcher and then shifted to investigating the positive influence of dogs on human behavior. This includes how dogs influence our cognition, our perception, our memory, our physical health, and psychological health for people of all ages. Also, her main focus has been on preschoolers and how they can benefit from interactions with dogs. Nancy did her PhD with Doug Nelson at the University of South Florida, and then she was on faculty at Fredonia State University in New York for many years, where she excelled as an instructor and mentor. I was fortunate enough to be one of her first undergraduate students, and she was my first research mentor and knowing her really changed the course of my career. She taught me about academic careers and inspired me to pursue one. And this went beyond just coursework. We went to conferences together. Uh, we had some of those really key discussions about the future of the field. And she made the possibility of an academic career uh, exciting and possible for me. I wish every young enthusiastic college student could have a mentor like Nancy. Her examples still continue to influence my thinking today. Uh, at one point in the past, Nancy got a poodle named Louie, and she started training Louie in agility skills to become a competitive agility dog. And she was doing this using her memory knowledge. Implicit and explicit memory was kind of her main focus. And then she started to focus more on actually doing research with dogs. And I think this is one of those uh, remarkable um, features of Nancy. Well, some of the really successful people in our field uh, began with their, their training in one area and then pivoted and did something extremely important for the real world. And so she's combined her memory knowledge and human measurement skills with all of this exciting work about dog-human interactions. She also spent time in the UK in industry working with the Mars Consumer Goods Company for five years gaining critical information about the applications for uh, human and dog interactions in the future. Um, she has a unique combination of skills that makes her really one of the most intriguing and inspiring people in this field. She is just one of a kind, um, combining human memory and cognition knowledge with the ability to measure those things uh, that make animal-human interactions work. She's an incredible teacher and um, has that real world knowledge. So I don't think there could be a more qualified person possibly in the world than Nancy G to address how do dogs affect our mental health and our psychological health. Nancy, take it away. So first of all, I wanna say a big thank you to, to Dan for that wonderful introduction. That was great. I really appreciate all your kind words. Um, I also, um, I want to say I'm going to talk about some great research uh, in this presentation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, do dogs make us physically and mentally healthier. I'm going to talk about some some great research. I'm going to do this at kind of a top line level and uh, really kind of dig into some uh, various aspects of the ongoing research in this area and sort of what we've done before. 
And also for the dog lovers out there, you'll probably see a few pictures of dogs. So I hope you enjoy some of the photos that I'm going to include in here. But really to dig into this topic, I think it is um, critical that we take a step back and, um, and really look at the historical perspective on, on uh, the process of domestication and selection and how that has literally happened over tens of thousands of years and how dogs have become, through this process, particularly adept uh, in terms of socializing with humans. They're sensitive to our emotional states and social gestures. They're able to communicate with us using a complex system of cues. They can uh, form complex attachments. And the reason that this is true is this process of domestication that took literally tens of thousands of years. And you can see on the left, we've got this wonderful cave painting where it depicts a human working alongside a dog to fend off predators. And similarly, a Pompeii mosaic shows uh, that we were keeping pets, keeping dogs as pets back in 79 AD. So our relationship with dogs is a very long and detailed and enduring relationship. And that heritage really starts with the, the gray wolf. Dogs emerge from wolves by adapting to human social demands over a period of about 35,000 years. And there is probably no other species on the planet as well matched to human social needs as that of dogs. But what's interesting about dogs is that through this lengthy selective breeding process, we now have an amazing variety of dog breeds that come in all shapes and sizes and coat colors and types. Some dogs were bred for specific behaviors and others for the way they look. And dogs as a species represent an impressive variety in which there is literally a dog for almost any occasion. And I do want to point out, if you look at this photo at the bottom, these four different dogs are actually the same breed. So even within this wide variety of breeds, we have uh, dogs that look very different within the same breed. So in terms of the importance of pets to humans, I think pet ownership numbers tell us a whole lot about the importance of pets. So if you look at some of the numbers from the UK, the EU, the United States, and Canada, you can see that dogs and cats are extraordinarily popular. And some 63 million households in the United States have a dog. But there's also a sobering reality about these animals. And in the United States, children are actually more likely to grow up with a pet in their home than a father. So this tells us about the key role that these pets are playing in the lives of humans, particularly children, as you can see with this statistic. So dog companionship is not only widespread, but it is extremely varied. And in many ways, there's no doubt that dogs are and have been helpful to humans. For example, if we just take working dogs, working dogs include service dogs, which are assistance and, uh, and alert dogs. And so assistance dogs help individuals with disabilities, such as vision, hearing, mobility, um, psych psychological disabilities like, like PTSD. Alert dogs work to alert people to things like the oncoming seizure or diabetic crisis. And these dogs are all protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's an indication of the importance of these animals to their owners. It's also uh, important to think about other jobs that dogs do for us. So detection dogs, for instance, they detect drugs and bombs and cadavers. They detect people who are lost or buried alive or even the presence of COVID. And I think it's important to point out that search and rescue operations that involve dogs take place in literally every single earthly environment. So it just speaks to the importance of these dogs and their widespread involvement and assistance with humans. Further, 
working dogs have uh, helped us with transportation, herding, and protection. So for example, sled dogs. Sled dogs help humans to traverse cold and formidable terrain, move longer distances than we ever could have done without their assistance. Dogs have helped humans to maintain our food supplies. They do things like herding sheep, and cattle, and ducks, and goats, and they also protect those, those flocks for us as well. Now, animals, dogs have been trained to, uh, to also protect protection and uh, transportation in other ways. So for example, they now go to airports and they, um, they protect transportation by removing or sort of chasing off geese and ducks and other birds that could potentially interfere with air travel. Even more, they protect our leisure activities by herding birds away from golf courses. As I understand it, some golf courses can be, well, plagued by aggressive geese. And so dogs to the rescue, they're even protecting our ability to play golf. Dog sports also are on the rise. Dan mentioned that I was involved in agility. People are getting involved in various dog sports. Dog sports include agility, fly ball, frisbee, dock diving, retrieving, obedience, scent work, high jumping, and many, many more. And it is just amazing the number of different activities that humans are now involved with, with our canine companions. But the vast majority of dog owners simply enjoy their companionship. So this often includes taking your dog for a walk, or a hike, or a blank fetch, maybe training them, or just sitting on the couch and cuddling with your dog. Our long history together and the continued proliferation of dogs in our lives indicates that there really is something unique about this human-animal bond. And I want to take a moment just to focus in on this thing called the human-animal bond. The American Veterinary Medical Association defined the human-animal bond as a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and other animals influenced by behaviors that are essential to the health and well-being of both. What I really love about this definition is the first two parts of it. It is mutually beneficial, which indicates that both the human and the dog gain from the experience. And it is dynamic in that it changes over the life course of both the human and the dog. So for example, humans interact differently when they're children compared to when they're adults, compared to when they're older. Same thing with dogs. They play differently when they're puppies compared to when they're adults, compared to when they're older. And I think it's important that we consider that dynamic nature of that relationship. But what is interesting about our attachment or bond with animals is that it mirrors that of human attachment. So Ainsworth stipulated there are four roles of an attachment figure. And HAI, or human-animal interaction researchers, are basically pointing out in many ways that dogs fulfill each of these four roles. So they're enjoyable, they're comforting, they're missed when absent, and they're sought in times of distress. And it is the fact that we have these similar attachment styles. So the way an infant attaches to his or her caregiver is very similar to the way a dog attaches to his or her caregiver. And in fact, people report turning to their pets for love and support. 50% of adults and 70% of children report confiding in their pets. There's no need to worry about confidentiality or reprisals or judgments or meeting expectations. And I was involved in a study with Cambridge University in which we, um, we compared adolescents' relationships with their siblings. We compared adolescent relationships with their dogs, uh, their pets, to those of their siblings. And what we found out is that adolescents derive more satisfaction from and less conflict with their pets than their own siblings. So it's really interesting to see that in those relationships, even children or adolescents are reporting a greater connection to dogs. So the question that I want to answer in, in this presentation is, are there health benefits? So what I want to do is parse out the distinction between owning a dog versus interacting with the dog, because research in those two topics is very different. So first I'm going to start with dog ownership. And 
part of the problem when we talk about dog ownership is that we can sell them in fur causal claims. And the reason for this is because it is subject to what is known as a selection bias. So this means that people don't really want a researcher to randomly assign them to own a particular kind of pet. Instead, they want to pick a pet for themselves. So people prefer to decide whether they own a dog or a horse or a cat or no pet at all. And so it makes it challenging to do this kind of research. And I often have people ask me, is it a healthy thing? Should I go out and get a dog? Is that good for me? And I often liken this to owning a bicycle. You can ask the same question. Is it healthy to own a bicycle? And my response to that is, well, if you don't ride it, probably not. But if you do get out there and you ride that bicycle, it probably is a healthy decision to get a bicycle. So it's probably the case that the more we interact and the more involved we are with dogs, the more we're likely to reap those benefits of interacting with dogs. So I think we need to go one step further. So a dog is different from a bicycle in that we do have this attachment. We have this special bond with these dogs. And so I think we need to consider that a dog, you're probably more likely to be attached or more strongly attached to a dog or to a bicycle. So the analogy only goes so far. But with all of that said, let's talk generally about what the research is showing us with regards to dog ownership. So one thing we do know is that animals tend to be social icebreakers. Um, and James Circle refers to them as the great leveler. And the idea is that dogs transcend social boundaries like race and culture and geography and politics and socioeconomic status. People will actually risk directly engaging with somebody they don't even know when there's a dog present. Because it's a simple conversation, you talk about the dog and all those other things don't come into the situation. And, and what's interesting is that people with disabilities, particularly those who are accompanied by a service dog, they experience a greater number of social greetings, more approaches by other people, and they themselves report that they're more willing to go outside when they have their dog. So dogs are making a difference from a social perspective. So now what I'd like to do is just discuss some of the scientific evidence from a really top line perspective, but then separate the discussion into this pet ownership versus pet interaction. And I'll start with children. So what do we know about pet ownership when it comes to children? There's some evidence that indicate that when a child grows up with a pet in their home, they have fewer sick days from school, they're less likely to have allergies or asthma, and there's a study with five and six-year-olds indicating they're less likely to be obese. Children are also, who have a, who have a pet in their home, report having higher self-esteem, greater empathy, they're more popular with their classmates, and they're more likely to be involved in hobbies, clubs, and my personal favorite, household chores. Now, with all of that said, we have to be careful with this kind of research because it is correlational. So it means that when you study pet ownership, people picked for themselves, typically whether they own a pet or not. But it also, much of this research tends to lack control conditions. So let's take allergies and asthma, for example. It's commonly thought that if you have a pet in your home, the child is less likely to have allergies and asthma. And in fact, the research tends to show that. But why is that the case? So it's very possible that if a child, for instance, has a severe allergy to a dog, that family would choose not to own the dog. In which case, we're pulling out the most severe allergy cases out of the dog ownership category. So then the ones that are left are less likely to have allergies and asthma. So the research, you have to be a little bit careful with some of the conclusions that we can draw from this research. Likewise, older adults. We've seen with older adults who have pets, they're less likely to be lonely. They have reduced incidence of depression, lower blood pressure, lower stress. They're more likely to be physically active. They socialize more. Um, they tend to have higher uh, mental functioning. And we've seen a study that indicates that they recover more quickly from strokes. 
again. We have to be very careful about this research for the same reasons I mentioned previously, but it's also important to point out that the literature is, is plagued by conflicting findings. For example, if we just take the finding on depression, there are studies that show that older adults who have a dog are less depressed than those who don't, for example. But there are other studies that show that older adult pet owners are more depressed. And so we have to be really careful about these findings because there are these mixed results. One reason for this potential finding itself is that with depression, people often uh, want to self-medicate by acquiring a pet. So it's very possible that pet owners are likely to be a, sort of have more individuals with depression if they're self-medicating by acquiring a pet. Also relevant to the topic of older adults is that as older adults have poor health, they're less likely to have a pet of any kind. And so then they're pulling themselves out of the population. So older adults who own pets tend to be healthier than older adults who don't own pets. So again, we just have to be careful with this research and the conclusions that we draw from it. But with all of that said, the evidence on heart health is compelling and noteworthy. So pet owners, compared to non-pet owners, have significantly lower blood pressure, plasma triglycerides, and cholesterol. And they're more likely to be alive one year following a heart attack. So the American Heart Association actually pulled together a group of international researchers to evaluate the existing research on pet ownership and cardiovascular disease. And they issued a scientific statement that says pet ownership, particularly dog ownership, is probably associated with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. And they go one important step further. The next bullet point, pet ownership, particularly dog ownership, may have some causal role in reducing cardiovascular disease risk. That's a big deal to put that word causal in there. So that's an important finding. And it's, again, it's a review of all of the literature. Okay. Now what I'd like to do is shift gears a little bit, and I'd like to talk about dog interactions. So the, the evidence on dog interactions, the studies allow us to be more manipulative. So researchers can do things like decide whether or not an individual will interact with a dog, how long they will interact, what type of interaction it will be. Are they gonna walk or groom or pet or talk or, or what to the dog? We can also manipulate which populations are involved, the settings, whether it's structured or unstructured, whether it's goal-driven or not. So this kind of research allows us to have some stronger evidence. So what I want to do now is kind of pick some topics within animal-assisted interactions with a focus on dogs and talk about the results there. So first up is older adults, and I want to talk about physical health of older adults. So in a recent systematic review of the literature that I did alongside Megan Mueller, we reviewed 145 studies involving pets and older adults. And we looked at the scientific merit of those studies and evaluated the strength and quality of the evidence. And each of the bullet points you're seeing here is at least one study showing that result and oftentimes more studies showing that particular result. So for older adults, who interact with a dog, we see reductions in cardiopulmonary, neurohormone, and anxiety measures, heart rate, muscle tension, and skin temperature, and blood pressure. All of those are sort of about stress reduction. And then we also see a reduced risk of falls and hospitalization rates. On the other side, we see an increase in physical activity, walking distance and speed, and walking ability and stability, just from interacting with the dog. In terms of mental health for older adults, we see reductions in depression. That evidence is pretty strong. Animal-assisted interactions are pretty good at reducing depression in older adults. Loneliness, anxiety, the evidence is there, but it isn't as strong as what we're seeing with depression. We're also seeing that behavior problems related to agitation, those are reduced. Fear tends to be reduced. Um, mental stress, as measured by salivary CGA, 
uh, is reduced. In terms of increases, we see an increase in social behavior and interactions. They're more willing to talk to other people and, and, and do more socially sort of uh, active events. They report an increase in their quality of life and mood and activities of daily life and even higher scores on the mini mental state exam. So what about children? What about interactions with children? There are a number of settings that we could explore, and I'm going to focus in on a small number of those. I'll start with school settings. So here, I'm going to combine the, the physical and mental health outcomes into one slide just for brevity. Uh, in, a, in a number of recent systematic reviews of the literature, interactions with dogs were found to provide a number of beneficial outcomes for children in school settings. So here are some of those results. Children show decreased impulsivity, aggression, salivary cortisol, skin conductance, social withdrawal, risk behavior, and increases in reading rate, accuracy and comprehension, memory, categorization, motor skills, adherence to instruction, attention, motivation, mood, responsibility, empathy, social functioning. You get the idea we're seeing some real improvements when we bring dogs into school settings to interact with children. With all of that said, even this work is not without methodological challenges. For example, some, but not all of these studies, have small sample sizes. Some don't use standardized measures, and some lack appropriate control conditions. But even so, the strength of the evidence is pretty solid. What I would like to do is focus in on two randomized control trials. So a randomized control trial is kind of the gold standard uh, if your goal is to establish a causal link. If we want to say that the presence of a dog causes this, we want to do a randomized control trial. So I want to talk about two of those that I was involved in. The first one was with Professor Kirsten Mainz and her team at the University of Lincoln in the United Kingdom. This study looked at both typical and special needs children, and the children were 8 to 10 years old. Uh, there were three conditions that they were randomly assigned into one of these three conditions. So one was an in-class dog intervention, another one was an in-class yoga relaxation condition, and the third one was a control condition where it was just a class as usual. This happened for over the course of four weeks, twice per week, 20 minutes each, and we measured longitudinally. So we took baseline assessments, post-intervention assessments, six weeks, six months, and one year assessments. And I'm gonna uh, just show you some of the really top line results out of the study in terms of the cognition results. If you look on the left, we've got for the mainstream children, we see two nice examples of how the dog intervention improved spatial ability and also a task known as the strip task, uh, which is about inhibiting uh, an automatic process. Um, for the special needs children, special needs children had to be separated into two different categories in order to provide them with tests that were appropriate to their ability level. And so for the purposes of this study, we simply called them higher abilities and lower abilities. The higher ability special needs children, we saw improvements on language comprehension and syntactic form formulation. With the lower abilities, we saw improvements on the picture similarity and the verbal comprehension. Attention. To make a long story short, what we're seeing here are improvements in cognition simply by interacting with the dog. In this study, we also looked at cortisol. So to start with, we did a, uh, a systematic review so that we could measure cortisol correctly. And if you look at the box on the left and the box on the right, these are baseline or basal cortisol readings that we took. And so this means that we take three cortisol measures three times a day for three days. And then we do that before they do the intervention and then after they're done with the intervention. We also took acute measures, and we did that in session one, four, and eight. So before each intervention, regardless of which one they were in, they provided a salivary sample before and after on session one, four, and eight. So let me show you the results. For the mainstream children, one of the things that is known to happen in school settings is that over the course of the term, cortisol rises because it becomes more stressful. And so what we were seeing is with the relaxation and the control conditions, we saw that expected rise in cortisol, but we didn't see that in the dog condition. 
So for some reason, the dog condition buffered that potential rise in cortisol. Further, when we looked at acute cortisol, so here, this is measured at session one, session four, and session eight, so before and after. What you're seeing here are the results just for the dog, the dog group, and the results are similar for the relaxation group. The control condition didn't look like this. So if you look at the red arrows, this is showing session one, pre and post measures. So you can see that cortisol was higher in the pre-test measure than it was in the post-test. So interacting with the dog reduced their cortisol level in session one, in session four, and again in session eight. So pretty consistently, simply interacting with the dog decreased their cortisol. That's for mainstream kids. For the special educational needs kids, one of the things that we found, I just want to draw your attention to the, uh, the graph on the left-hand side. It shows us that special educational needs children had higher cortisol levels across the term. So from pre to post, beginning to end, they had higher cortisol levels. And as we expected, the typical kids, I'm sorry, the, um, yeah, the mainstream kids, their cortisol levels were, were rising during that time. So we were expecting that. But the graph on the right shows us just the special needs kids in the three conditions, pre to post. And so if you take a look at just that line, the line with the arrow next to it, that's showing us that in the dog condition, their cortisol levels were dropping from pre to post across the term. The other conditions, they were not dropping. So it is interesting. The graph shows us a comparison of all three of these conditions, and the dog intervention did produce the lowest level of cortisol. Again, cortisol is a stress hormone. The higher that is, the more stress you're feeling. So what we're seeing is pretty consistent results showing that the presence of the dog does in fact reduce stress for these children. So in terms of the conclusions, what we can draw from this particular study is that both mainstream and special needs kids benefited from the dog intervention. And we saw clear effects on cognition and clear effects on stress as measured by cortisol. So it's possible that what's happening is the decrease in stress is driving the improvements in cognition because, well, the more relaxed you are, the smarter you can be, the more you have room to think. Okay, so that brings me to the next randomized control trial. This is with university students and it's at Washington State University. And um, this is Patricia Pendry. And here we had three conditions. So for this study, the academic stress management group received the standard evidence-based stress prevention program that's conducted by Washington State. So this is what they roll out as stress reduction for all students who are struggling with academic stress. So that was condition one. Condition two is we did a half and half condition. So we did half academic stress management and the other half was interacting with a dog. We call that HAI or human animal interaction in the hands. So academic stress management combined with HAI. Group three is HAI only. All they're doing is interacting with the dog. So students were randomly assigned into one of those three groups. The participants themselves were either typical university students or students who are at risk for academic failure. The procedure is kind of similar to the previous one that I described where we take assessments at baseline. We had a four week intervention. This time it was for an hour long session each. Then we did six week post test assessments and then 12 week assessments. In terms of the results, for university students, we found results for anxiety, motivation, and attitude. And I want to show you this picture because this is what it looked like. This is university students interacting with a dog and you can see they're enjoying themselves. What we found is that in the academic stress management HAI combined condition, the 50-50 condition, that's where we saw the greatest reduction in anxiety, improvement in motivation, and improvement in attitude. Students who were at risk for academic failure overall had a greater level of reduction in anxiety and a greater increase in motivation across the course of the study. 
Now, what we also did in this study is we looked at executive functioning. Now, executive functioning is a cluster of processes, including such things as working memory, planning, ability to inhibit irrelevant thoughts, and to stay on task. What we know about executive functioning is that it tends to predict academic and life success. So it's pretty important. Um, it's also negatively affected by stress. So the more stressed you are, the more your executive functioning is suppressed. Now in this study, we actually use several measures of executive functioning. But here's an example of executive dysfunction. This is called the Global Executive Function Scale. And if you look at the top three or the solid lines, those are the students who are at risk for academic failure. The dotted lines represent typical students. Now this scale is flipped, so we're measuring dysfunction. So keep in mind here that higher scores indicate lower performance. So as we would expect, those students who are at risk for academic failure overall kind of had higher scores. But I want to draw your attention to this line. So this line indicates students at risk for academic failure who only interacted with the dog. Just the dog, no academic stress management content at all. What we see is just by interacting with the dog, we see that their dysfunction reduced. In other words, their executive function improved when they interacted with the dog. And in fact, it improved to the level of the typical university student, those who are not at risk for academic failure. And it was sustained at follow-up. So what can we conclude from this? Well, interacting with dogs and not standardized academic stress management programming actually improves executive functioning. Um, Adding the dogs to the academic stress management improves anxiety, motivation, and, atti and attitude. So the likely mechanism of, of action here is probably stress reduction. We still need to dig into this further, but it's very likely that if you're reducing somebody's stress, you can improve their executive functioning. Okay. Animal-assisted therapy is another important example of how interacting with a dog may have health-related influences. Um, Animal-assisted therapy involves a licensed mental health professional who purposefully incorporates a dog into their therapy sessions with their clients. And a recent systematic review focusing on AAT with adolescents found um, a number of interesting results. It reviewed a number of studies and found that for individuals who were seeking animal-assisted therapy, or having therapeutic interventions that involved an animal, we saw decreases in PTSD symptoms, we saw decreases in emotional and behavioral anger, and decreases in anxiety. This paper also reported that we saw increases in attendance, disclosure, and global functioning. But what's interesting is that depression either didn't change or it actually increased. This study highlights our need to better understand the circumstances under which a dog or the presence of a dog or interacting with the dog may be beneficial. When, where, and who does it affect? So in this particular case, it doesn't appear that it's effective for adolescents. So we need to, we need to have a greater depth in terms of understanding that. So AAT with adolescents does tend to be beneficial for reductions in things like primary symptomology, and it's also pretty good for improving therapeutic engagement and retention. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is dog interactions in hospital settings. Now, um, this is sort of the last of these intervention topics that I want to cover. And the VCU School of Medicine, Center for Human-Animal Interaction, houses the Dogs on Call program. It was founded in 2001, and it currently includes 91 therapy dog teams. By the way, therapy dog team is a, a dog and their human handler. The requirements to participate in this program are extensive. So the dog must be registered with one of two therapy dog organizations. They must pass a veterinary health and wellness exam. Um, they, uh, they have to be current on all their vaccines. The human 
has to complete the VCU Medical Center volunteer training, health screening, vaccinations, background check, fingerprinting, and both must comply with the Dogs on Call manual and the VCU Health Animals in the Hospital policy. Uh, when we aren't in a pandemic, our teams literally visit everywhere in the hospital, except they don't go into operating or delivery rooms, they don't go into cafeterias or anywhere where food is currently being served, uh, and they tend to not go into isolation rooms, though a doctor can't order uh, that they do go into an isolation room. So this program has been going on for a while. We did a patient satisfaction survey just to get a feel for whether the patients themselves are enjoying this or not. And so we surveyed 407 patients and we asked them a simple question. Was this visit helpful? And here's what we got. 99% of patients said yes. We found out later that the one person who said no was being discharged that day and didn't really get an opportunity to spend uh, quality time with the dog. But we followed up and we asked patients if it was helpful, tell us about why it was helpful. And so their responses included improved mood, they felt more relaxed, they were less lonely, less anxious, and then lesser responses were less fear, less pain and discomfort, and other categories. So that's what patients think. Let's look at the evidence. So we've done a number of studies. This is, this is presenting some of the research that we've done. So for example, in one study, we found that anxiety was reduced in psychiatric patients following a single dog's on call visit. Fear is reduced by 37% and anxiety by 18% in those patients who are waiting for electroconvulsive shock therapy. And cortisol was significantly reduced after five minutes of interaction. That study is really interesting because that study is on staff. And so what we did is we had staff give us a cortisol sample after interacting with the dog. And we compared that to staff sitting quietly alone in a room. And that cortisol result is similar to the reduction we saw when the same staff member would sit in a room for 20 minutes. So five minutes with a dog versus 20 minutes in a room by yourself and you get the same level of cortisol drop. So from a healthcare professional perspective, interacting with a dog can give you a quick fix, make you feel better and get you back to work. And it may actually have an impact on compassion fatigue, which is another thing that we're on the horizon to investigate. Um, on the other side, dogs on call, uh, being present in group therapy significantly increases attendance by patients, and our nursing staff uh, perceive overall improved mood in patients. So, do dogs make us healthier, physically or psychologically? Well, the research findings that I've summarized here indicate that from childhood to older adulthood, owning and particularly interacting with a dog is associated with a number of psychological and physical health benefits. So probably yes, but you knew there'd be a but. More research is needed. We really, the field is young. We need to know more. So what works for whom and under what circumstances? What dosage level? How long do they need to interact with the dog? How frequently do they need to interact with the dog? What aspects of the interaction are important? Is there a time course of the effects? In other words, how long do they last? Do they last short term or do they last over a long period of time? Some research is showing that they do last and others are showing us that it's a temporary kind of effect. What populations are most likely to benefit? And what about the role of pet ownership history? Do you have to have owned a dog to benefit from interacting with a dog? Some research says dog owners are more likely to benefit. They're more likely to accrue any potential benefits of interacting with the dog. And other research says, no, you don't have to have owned a dog. So again, I think we need more information. And this points to further considerations. There is a significant amount of variability in research outcomes in this field where we're seeing these mixed results. So we're seeing this as varied methods, measures, populations are probably driving these mixed results. Also, there's a positive publication bias. That's relevant to all scientific fields and variability in research outcomes is also relative to relevant to all scientific fields. But 
it's very possible that positive publication bias may be an, an even bigger impact in human-animal interaction. The reality is there are a whole lot of pet lovers out there in the world, and a lot of them want to see wonderful research published that shows the, the amazing benefits of dogs. So we have to maintain our objectivity in terms of evaluating that research. We also need to publish all result outcomes, regardless of whether they're significant or non-significant. Press coverage tends to distort results. So that Washington State study that I talked about, we got some amazing press coverage on it, but one article in particular, its headline was, having a dog on campus reduces dropout rates. And we didn't study dropout rates at all in that study. So we have to be very careful because the press is also very interested in talking about this kind of research and can kind of spin it or make it into something perhaps it really wasn't. And then it's important to keep in mind that nobody is forced to do this research. And so through the process of informed consent, you tell them what the study's about and you ask them whether they want to participate or not. So what that means is it's very unlikely that this research includes anybody who's afraid of dogs, severely allergic to dogs, or who don't like dogs. Also, there are cultural differences. We're aware of them, but we just don't know enough about them. So what we need to do in this research is really dig into cultural differences. In some uh, cultures, like Western society, pets are embraced, whereas in other cultures, they are not. So we need to dig into that and look at whether or not that is likely to play a role. So we have an encouraging foundation of evidence on which to build, and this is an absolutely exciting time to be involved in research on the human-animal bond. The future is bright. In conclusion, humans have a long and varied history with dogs. At the start of this presentation, I mentioned the variety of ways working dogs support humans, and humans are involved with their dogs in a wide variety of dog sports and other activities. There's no shortage of photos of people from all walks of life with posing with their faithful companions. Historic photos, famous actors, singers, athletes. We certainly don't want to leave out our world leaders. Posing for a photo with a family dog is both fun and seen as a positive personality trait. So if you pose with your dog, people tend to look at your photo and smile. How often have you pulled out your own phone and said, let me show you a picture of my dog? The bond we share with dogs, it transcends skin color, gender, age, politics, and many other potential sources of disagreement or controversy. Dogs bring us together at a time when it seems that our world is very divided. So if you ask me, do I think dogs are good for our health? Yes, I do. And I also recognize that they're not a panacea. I'd like to thank my collaborators. I'm really grateful to VCU and VCU Health for their incredible support of our program and this entire center. Um, and with all of that said, are there any questions? Fantastic talk. Uh, that was incredibly enlightening about um, some really impressive data about what dogs are really doing for us. Um, if you're interested in asking a question, please use the Q&A uh, button below, uh, not the chat button. Um, I'll go ahead and start us off by um, asking a question related to our current times. Uh, I feel as if I've heard a lot about dogs being um, allowed in workplaces, and certainly there are more dogs probably in home offices than ever. I wonder if there are any studies that you're doing or, or that you know of, of work productivity for uh, mainstream adults as to whether they get a benefit of similar um, types, whether it be stress or cognition benefits. It's a really great question, and it, and it is a, a viable research area. There's a, there are a number of studies that have been done and that are ongoing with regard to animals in the workplace. There's some positive results showing that the presence of the pet can do things like make people more motivated, make them more interested in working longer periods of time because they have their animal with them. They don't, they don't have to worry about whether their animal has an opportunity to exercise because they can take their dog for a walk on their break and come right back and get right back down to work. Um, it, it's also very nice to just take a break and take a moment to pet your dog. Um, so, 
So the results are showing that yes, it is beneficial to have your dog at work, but it needs to be done sort of carefully and with planning. And so I can give an example. Since I since I worked for Mars, they had a pets at work policy. So you could bring your dog to work. And they handled it really well. They had a sign that basically said, I have a pet here. And so people could approach your desk knowing that there's an animal there. So if anybody is anxious or uncertain or allergic, they would know whether a dog is there in advance. And they had specific areas marked out for the animals to go and exercise. And it was they sort of built it into the culture of the work environment. Environment. And it seemed to be a really positive addition to the work environment. Okay, fantastic. Um, I wanted to uh, go to one of the Q&A questions next. Um, during this particular time with COVID-19, uh, bringing dogs around college students or hospital patients may not be safe. Um, is there research uh, that suggests that looking at pictures or possibly videos of animals can help reduce stress or cortisol in general? I personally will say probably because I loved all the dog pictures in your talk and was found it very engaging. So is there data on that? There, there is actually. So there's some data. If we if we just look at fish, for instance, there's some data that shows that looking at a live aquarium versus watching a video of a live aquarium tend to have similar effects. The real question here, though, is do you need to be able to reach out and touch the dog to benefit from the interaction or can it be done via Zoom? And there is some research, in fact, I've done some of it, indicating that you don't actually have to touch the dog to benefit. In fact, that Washington State study, they, um, it's, it's really a good problem to have, but human-animal interaction research is the only research that I'm aware of where we need crowd control. So when we do events in libraries, for instance, we have students lining up out the library and down the hall and you know outside the building and so on. And we've actually studied the people who are lining up to, and so they're watching other people interact with the dogs. They're not actually physically close enough yet. And we're seeing improvements in mood. We're seeing some of those effects even before they pet the animal. Now, what we're doing here at VCU Health is we're starting virtual patient visits since we're not going into patient rooms right now. So our, we have somebody who takes an iPad and then, or a patient can have their own device and they can interact with one of our dogs on call teams. And so we don't know enough yet as to whether that's effective in terms of the same kind of benefits. It seems like people really genuinely do want to have the actual dog present. But even though we can't have that, the presence of the dog on the screen is still conferring some benefits and some elevation and mood. Yeah, dogs are so popular when they enter a room. Um, it's, it's like a celebrity. Um, so uh, this is another question that's sort of getting at the animal human interaction piece. Um, do dog, are, are there measures in dog cortisol levels or possibly dog behaviors that are synergistic, suggesting that they um, also are responsive as part of the, the sort of dyad in these interactions? This is a great question. I'm so glad you asked it because the dog welfare side is so important to me and there is research on this topic. So first of all, we look at oxytocin. So oxytocin is kind of a love feel good hormone. And when a mother, for instance, is interacting with her baby, she's releasing oxytocin. And so it's this kind of bonding hormone. And what we find is that with dogs, when we are looking at a dog and gazing into their eyes, we're releasing oxytocin like crazy. Up from the dog side, what they really enjoy is when we do long strokes down their body. And so they also are enjoying the interaction. In terms of these events, like taking dogs into the library and that sort of thing, we've done some behavioral analysis on that. And what we see, so we can look at stress signs in dogs. And what we see is that they show an, a level of excitement. They're wagging their tails, they're very excited, and they're pulling to get to the person that they really can't wait to interact with. So that is a level of stress because it's excitement. But once they're there, they settle into this really kind of, it, it's almost as if they are at work and they understand that they're at work and this is what I do and these are all my people and my fans and they're here to pet me and just you know it, it understand how wonderful I am. 
And uh, so we do see behaviorally that dogs show a level of excitement, but what we haven't seen is that they show signs of stress that would be indicative of a, a negative kind of stress where we would want to get them out of the environment. Now, occasionally a therapy dog can come to work and maybe they don't feel good, maybe they're sick. That dog may show some signs of stress or lack of interest. And so what we do is we're constantly monitoring their behaviors. And when their behaviors indicate that they're either not having fun or they're not really interested in doing it, we make that all part of the experience for everyone around them and help them to understand that the dog gets a choice in this too. And the dog can say, I don't want to do this today. And the dog can then you know, exit. And the handler's responsibility is to help understand when the dog is saying, I need to go and help get them out of the building. From those images, the dogs looked like they were having the time of their lives uh, mm -hmm. rolling around there. <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch of questions. There's too many questions to possibly cover, but multiple have been asked about cats. So uh, you probably get this one a lot. Um, do you see similar types of benefits or maybe different benefits from cat ownership or the presence of cats? I, I get this question a lot as well. And I just want to go on record as saying I love cats. I personally love cats. With that said, cats are not involved nearly as much in the research uh, because cats aren't, aren't typically well suited to go into a patient room, for, for example. Um, now, with, with that said, the research on cat ownership is very mixed. So in that study that showed that people were more likely to be alive one year later after having had a heart attack if they owned a dog, that same study showed that people who owned a cat were more likely to not be alive. So <laughs> there are some, now with that said, again, the results are mixed, but we just don't have as much evidence related to cats and what we have is really mixed. So it is challenging to draw conclusions with regards to cats. Yeah, I can say that uh, more than one cat has elevated my cortisol level <laughs> rather than reducing it, <laughs> depending <laughs> upon their behavior, of course. Um, one more question that um, I, I think is really relevant in these times, um, particularly with an election cycle coming up, about empathy. So you had mentioned a, um, a greater empathy level with uh, the presence of dogs in children. Um, are there, is there evidence that there's a similar uh, benefit possibly in adult uh, populations with, um, with em increased empathy around canines? Yeah, empathy studies are, um, are a little bit challenging because of the way those questions tend to be asked. People want to indicate that they're being empathetic. It's kind of like um, attachment measures. Do you love your dog? Who's gonna say no? So most people tend to score high on attachment, though there are some better attachment scales. So with regards to empathy, what we're seeing with children is oftentimes when we do animal education programs and we, um, we go into a classroom and teach children about interacting with, with the dog and about what is safe and what is appropriate and also about what they think the dog feels. And so that helps them with that process of developing empathy. That's not typically explored as frequently in older adults or even in adults. Um, so we just don't have the evidence on that. I'd be curious to see, it's very likely that adults who have dogs may be more empathetic, but are they more empathetic to dogs or to people? And you know, does that translate? I don't know. It's a good question. Okay, one more. Uh, we have time for just one more question. We'll make it another timely one related to COVID-19 uh, and pets. Uh, I wonder if you're you're doing any active studies or if you know of studies that are, um, or programs possibly that are um, seeing a, whether um, people can cope with social isolation a bit better with dogs. I had heard just anecdotally that there had been a huge uh, upsurge in uh, pet adoptions during uh, yeah. the initial phase of the pandemic. I wonder if that trend's continuing and if there's a way that you can study that to um, appreciate some of those other health benefits. 
Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because what we're seeing is veterinary practices tend to be doing really well during COVID because so many people have acquired pets during the pandemic. Uh, there are a number of ongoing surveys. In fact, I'm involved in one of those surveys looking at um, basically a number of things like the degree to which you are lonely and feeling socially isolated and did your pet, and it looks at a variety of different kinds of pets, play a role in helping you to feel like you have a purpose and helping you to feel less lonely. So those studies are in fact ongoing. I'm curious to see what they look like because I have a lot of people who are telling me all the time that if it weren't for my dog, I don't know what I would have done through this pandemic. And, and the other thing is dogs joining Zoom meetings. I mean, this is happening all the time. People are loving this. I personally have done it myself when I'm at home. I'll bring my dog on the Zoom call. Everybody enjoys it. They love showing pictures of their dogs. Cats join. I've had people get booted out of a meeting because their cat, you know, clicked the leave button by accident. They had to rejoin. And, you know, people love that. It's enjoyable. And, it, and you know, it lightens an otherwise pretty stressful time in all of our lives. Dan, can I ask a quick question? Uh, of course, Sandy, go, go right ahead. Yeah, Nancy, thank you uh, for an incredibly stimulating conversation. So we're track going to start tracking 120,000 people across the lifespan to see if we can promote brain health. Do you have any recommendations for questionnaires about pets that we can include in this? And do you see a prescription being made for people uh, when we start to see them lose kind of cognitive capacity or psychological well-being, which is part of our holistic brain health index. This is wonderful. I'm so glad you're gonna put pet questions in there. Absolutely, yes, I've got questions for you. We're, do, we're working right now with the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, and we put a bunch of questions in there. The Health Retirement Survey has questions. There are a number of these nationwide um, surveys that have included pet questions, and it's about time. That's wonderful, because we do need to look at the effect of pets over the life course of, of people and the effect that they have, and when people acquire pets and when they opt to not have have pets and how that has an impact. Absolutely. Yes. We're going to get back with you. Thank you so much. Perfect. We're going to get Perfect. back to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so we will wrap up at this point. Uh, we will thank Dr. Nancy G for her insights about this critically important piece of our health and social interactions. Um, I am going to go out right after this and throw some knuckle balls to my dog in the backyard. <laughs> but before I do so, I want to close out by uh, reminding people that uh, we are going to uh, be continuing the Frontiers lecture series throughout this fall. Um, tune in on the 13th of November for Steve Vernino, who's going to talk about encephalitis and autoimmune function. And also, uh, as Sandy Chapman had just mentioned, the very large study, the Brain Health Project, is actively recruiting. So if you're interested in participating in one of these large longitudinal studies and uh, learning about your health and cognition over time, we will provide links uh, and emails uh, to follow um, so you can get more involved. So we will uh, wrap up here. Thank you so much to Dr. Nancy G of VCU and we'll see you all again next time.